Hey, so today we're going to talk about buoyancy since we've already learned about density. So today's lesson success criteria is hopefully by the end of this, you can tell me what buoyancy is. You can define buoyant force and tell me what things are possible because of buoyancy. But before we get started, we're going to watch a Eureka video. Here we go. All right, so what is buoyant force? Well, buoyant force is the upward force exerted on objects that are submerged in a fluid. And just a reminder that when I talk about fluids, I'm talking about a liquid or a gas. So hopefully from grade seven, you remember that a force is a push or a pull. And in fact, let's even write that down here. Force is a push or a pull. Uh, and buoyant force is basically a push that happens because of the liquid that has been displaced by the object when it goes into the fluid. We're going to learn more about that. Now, force is measured in newtons. We're not going to get crazy into what a newton is. Uh, and we're not going to deal with numbers for this, which is nice for those of you who aren't a huge fan of the math part of the science course. But at the end of the day, if you want to know how much a Newton is, one Newton is about the force that gravity pulls on 100 grams. Not exactly, but close. So if you had a 100 gram chocolate bar, for example, the weight you feel in your hands, uh, that would be one Newton. So buoyancy works against the force of gravity. Force of gravity is always pulling down, right? It's the weight of something. Uh, and buoyancy is actually pushing up and it's pushed up by the fluid that the thing is actually in. So before we actually get into looking at some buoyant forces, let's consider of these three different beakers and the fluids that are in them, which one do you think would have the greatest buoyant force? And what I want you to think about here, what this is all about is density. So if I look at the green one, that's kind of medium density, orange is low, and the pink is high density. So if you were to put something in this, which one do you think would have the greatest buoyant force? And the answer is the pink one. The pink one would have the highest buoyant force because it has the particles that are closest together. So you can imagine that because these particles are more densely packed, they would exert more force on something that's going into it. Uh, so more particles, higher density, means that we will have more buoyant force. So a great example of this is actually if we take regular Coke and Diet Coke and put it into water. I don't want to ruin the surprise. Watch the video. So what's happening here is that actually when you have a lot of sugar in Coke, in regular Coke, it actually makes the density higher. It has a higher density than Diet Coke, which has aspartame and less in there than uh, normal Coke has sugar. So as a result, the regular Coke having a higher density, the particles are closer together, will sink, while the Diet Coke, uh, with the particles a little bit further apart, not having as high of a density, will actually float. So let's learn about how this works further. We're going to first consider a person floating and the different forces we have on somebody floating in a pool. So if we have a swimmer, we actually have two forces happening here. We've got a force of gravity, of course, that's pulling this person down, right? So Earth is pulling on this person and we have a force of gravity that is going straight down. But we also have a buoyant force from that water and the buoyant force is going straight up. So let's write out the full thing here. This is force of gravity. And then up we have buoyant force from the water. So we have force of gravity pulling down and buoyant force from the water. And for somebody floating, this is equal. The buoyant force pushing up is just as much as the force of gravity that is pulling down on the person. Water can support very large objects as long as it displaces more than its mass of water. So let's get into actually how buoyancy works. And I think that this iceberg actually gives us really a good opportunity to talk about this. When the iceberg goes into water, all of this that I'm outlining in yellow ends up displacing water as it goes in. So imagine the iceberg getting dropped into the water. I know that's not how it works, but imagine it for a second. The original water, let's say, was here. And then once that iceberg goes into the water, well, the water level rises up as a result. All the water that is or was where the iceberg now is, 
is displaced. It gets moved and has to end up going higher as a result. So that is actually the reason for the buoyant force. It's because of the water that gets displaced by the thing going into the water. And at the end of the day, the mass of water that gets displaced is equal to the mass of the total iceberg. As long as that's equal, it's going to float. Okay, so this mass that ends up getting displaced in water is equal to the mass of the total iceberg. So when we take a look at any object that floats in water, the amount of water that gets displaced by it is going to be equal to the total mass of that object. Think about a boat. When somebody new steps into that boat, do you notice how that boat sinks down a little bit further? It actually sinks down by as much mass getting displaced of water as the new person coming into the boat, right? So let's say that a 100 kilogram person steps into the boat, well then 100 kilograms of water is going to now be displaced as the boat sinks more into the water. So the design of an object can be just as important as the density of the materials used. When we take a look at whether something will float and have buoyancy or sink, what we consider is the average density of the whole object. The total mass of all substances or all stuff in that object divided by the total volume is going to actually give us that average density. Remember that density is equal to mass divided by volume, right? So if I take the mass of all the different substances that I have in a thing and divide it by the total volume, well, then I get the density. So think about a life jacket. When somebody puts on a life jacket, what they're doing is they're actually just um, using something that's very low density to lower their average density. So the life jacket has volume, but it has very little mass. Life jackets are very, very light. So as a result, what happens is you're uh, causing the average density of that person to go down. So they become less dense than the water. And as a result, this allows the person to float. Benefits of average density, how we actually use this. Well, it enables objects that would sink to float and also helps objects that normally would float to sink. Uh, if you think about a submarine, how a submarine works is it actually has uh, compartments in it that either will fill up with water uh, in order for it to sink, which would make the average density higher so that it's more dense with, than water and then it would sink down, or they would pump out the water to leave empty space, which means that the average density gets lower than water and then it floats up to the surface. Uh, fish actually have this kind of swim bladder in them as well that they use to manipulate their density so that they can sink down or rise up just like a submarine does. Uh, so average density allows things to sink or float. And again, all we're doing when we're talking about average density is we're looking at the total mass of something and dividing it by the total volume. This also is how balloons and blimps do their thing and basically fly and float in the air. So what they do is if you take a look at this blimp, for example, uh, the full mass right, of this blimp, including the kind of person and basket and whatever down below, if I divide that by the volume, that density is lower than the actual air that gets displaced by the blimp. So as a result, it floats up. Okay, so the average density is lower than the air itself. And normally how this works is they heat up air using like fire or something. And then as the air gets heated up inside of the balloon or the blimp, it gets further apart for the particles. It gets less dense. Remember that as we raise temperature, density goes down. So what they'll do is they'll heat up the air in the balloon or the blimp. This will lower the density of the air and it will get to the point where the average density, if we consider the density of the whole thing, the balloon, the basket, it's actually lower than the air around it. And as a result, it's going to flow up, uh, float up. Now we want the difference in density between the air and the balloon to be very, very small because otherwise it would be like raw, huge jet up with the balloon or big fast sinking as we bring the density of the balloon higher. So we're talking about very small differences between the density of the air and the balloon or the blimp, but still really neat that this occurs.
So the person who kind of came up with this was Archimedes, and he discovered two things. He discovered, number one, that you can determine the density uh, of something if you know the mass, but not the volume. And you can do that by measuring the volume indirectly, which we're going to talk about. And he also learned about buoyant force, and we're going to talk about how buoyant force works and why it happens. So how do you find the volume of something? Well, how you find the volume of something is actually by displacing water. So he figured out that if you actually take an object and put it into water and you're measuring the volume of the water, then you can actually find out the volume of the object by the difference of the water before and after. So here's a great example. If I take a look at this original water, let's say that it's right at, and let's change colors here because that really doesn't show up very well. Let's say that it's at 200 milliliters. So I have 200 milliliters of water here. And then if I put a rock in it and it ends up being 260 milliliters, then I know that the rock itself is 60 milliliters of volume because that's how much the water got displaced. You actually could do this really easily at home. Now what we're using here is something called a graduated cylinder that's meant to measure volume of uh, liquids. But you could actually even do this with a container and let's say a mass scale. If you took a container and filled it all the way to the top with water, right? So you have it all the way to the top, right to the very brim with water, and then you dump something in. Then as it sinks, water is going to flow out of that container. If you collect that water and you measure the mass or the volume of that water, you know the volume of the object. Remember that water has a density of one uh, gram per milliliter. So if I measure the mass of the water that comes out, I know the volume. And then I know the volume of the object I put in. Or you could measure it with a measuring cup or something, whatever you may have. But this is a way that you can actually figure out volume of stuff by displacing the water and seeing what happens. How volume changes. So Archimedes' principle is this. When Archimedes stepped into a bathtub, he sank. This is because the amount of water he was displacing weighed less than he did. So something will sink if it displaces a lower mass of water than the thing going into the water. But when he stepped into a boat, he floated. And this was because a larger volume of water was displaced than the weight of the boat and the person and everything else that was there. Remember that at the bottom of the boat, we actually have empty space, right? We've got the boat itself and then there's empty space inside of the boat. And that's included in the average density. So if I put a boat into water, here's my amazing picture of a boat, and here's the water, this portion of the boat displaced that much water. Well, if I take a look at the total boat's mass, that will be equal to the amount of water that gets displaced from the boat going in it. And as a result, it floats. Okay, so as long as it displaces as much water as goes into it as the mass is, so as long as it displaces as much water in terms of mass as the boat itself, whatever's in the boat, it's going to float. So that's essentially Archimedes' principle. The buoyant force acting on an object equals the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So as much fluid as gets moved by the object as it goes in, that is actually the buoyant force acting on the thing. So density and buoyancy very closely related, and we can actually figure out if something will have buoyancy, will float based on density. The buoyant force of a liquid or gas depends on its density. Uh, one way that we can measure this for a liquid is actually using something called a hydrometer. And depending on how much it sinks, that will actually tell us how much buoyant force we have. So if the water level is right here, then we know that, you know, the buoyancy is whatever. Um, let's say that instead we actually have a lower density fluid. Well, then maybe it would end up going up to here and this would sink down more. So essentially, the higher the density of the liquid, the less this is going to actually sink into the fluid. So we can use a hydrometer to measure the density. And I have one, so we'll probably do a demo on this later on so that you can see it. So what is buoyancy? Buoyancy is the ability for something to float. So it's the ability of something to float. in a fluid.
Define buoyant force. Buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid that gets displaced by the object going into the fluid. What things are possible because of buoyancy? Well, I mean, all the stuff that you saw, right? Boats, um, the balloons, the blimps, all that kind of stuff. Anything that floats is actually because of buoyancy. Us being able to swim is because of buoyancy. When you look at life jackets, that's buoyancy. That's all stuff that's possible because of buoyancy. Uh, one last thing to talk about. So how do you know if something's going to float? So it will float if... I look at average density of the object. If the density of the object I see writing is less than the density of the fluid, it's going to float. So if the density of the object that I'm putting in is less when I consider all of the thing, yeah, all of the thing. If it's less than the density of the fluid, then it's going to actually float. But if the density of the object is more than the density of the fluid, it will sink. Uh, I have two ifs here. The density of the object is greater than the fluid, then it's going to sink. So one last thing that I want to kind of propose and I want you to think about that is related to this and I think kind of interesting is if I take a look at a boat, a boat, you know, it floats. Typically a boat floats, news for you. Um, so I've got a boat here, beautiful boat. Oh, and there's my water, it's so pretty. Let's, let's put a little sail on there, hey? Now you know it's a boat. So I've got a boat and it's floating. How come when I make a hole in this boat, here's the hole, oh no, how come it sinks? What's happening that causes it to now become not buoyant, for it to not float? So what is changing when water gets into the boat that makes it sink. Think about it. And the answer is that as water goes into that boat, I'm actually making the density of that boat higher. Because as water flows in, that boat, the average density, is becoming greater. It used to have air or empty space in the bottom, and now it's got water. So when I consider the whole boat, including the empty space inside the boat, right? So empty space inside the boat, um, when I consider that, that's part of its average density. And if I have a hole in that, I'm now raising the average density to the point where it no longer is going to have a density that is lower than the water, and then the boat will sink. Sad. So raises the average density of the boat. There's another factor as well that as more water flows into the boat, then that actually means it's not displacing as much water. So then on top of that, the buoyant force will also decrease that's pushing up on the boat as more and more water flows into it and it's not displacing as much water. Okay, that's it for today. Have a good one.